Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is retired Air Force Colonel Sarah Cleveland, a Senior Strategic Advisor for Public Sector at ExtraHop. Thank you for being here. Justin, thank you for having me. It's a real privilege to be here today. Absolutely, and we're excited to get into the conversation here. I think one of the things that we wanted to cover is zero trust. It's kind of this new North Star for agencies and their cybersecurity efforts, and it's you know an across-the-board push across security architectures. It's been ongoing for several years now. What are some of the recent trends that you're seeing in this big zero trust push? So zero trust is an, is an absolute next stop for security, um, not just because you need to know who's accessing your network, why they're accessing their net, your network, when, how much, um, all of that. It's good control and hygiene of your data um, access and security. Um, there's other things that have probably brought this to the forefront even sooner than it would have been, and that's the pandemic and the hybrid workforce and knowing how people access their data back at the um, office. Um, and then Zero Trust will also open the way for maybe VPN replacements, um, bring your own device uh, devices to work. Um, but it, it's really something that we absolutely have to go to in this current cybersecurity environment with people who mean to do us harm. Um, and the network is a, a highway that everybody operates on. We all have a responsibility to secure who's on it and what they're doing. Makes a lot of sense. And I mean, this is something that the government is moving toward, the federal government is moving toward as a mandate under the federal zero trust strategy. But of course, there's a whole other piece of this, which is the private sector. Uh, you know, how do you see the private sector, which obviously doesn't have any sort of mandate at this point, moving towards zero trust, approaching zero trust as the government kind of makes its way toward that path? Yeah, you know, that, that recent mandates this year, the National Cybersecurity Strategy and then the National Cybersecurity Implementation Plan are two documents that have evolved out of uh, several other memorandums leading up to it, but now they're getting serious about it. Um, and the reason why the commercial industry needs to take note is if they expect to do business with the federal government or any sort of federal entity, they need to be practicing those same cybersecurity practices, which will include a zero trust implementation because you're only as good as your weakest link. Doing business with an entity that doesn't implement zero trust architecture can indeed put your, your operation at risk. So if you're going to be doing business with the federal government who has a zero trust architecture, there will be regulation that will be implemented that you have to practice those same, same practices. While ZTA is designated to operate on that principle of never trust, always verify, the lack of similar controls in that commercial environment could create vulnerabilities that attackers will exploit. Any organization that has that zero trust architecture implemented will likely be less of a target for a person meaning to do you harm because it's difficult. Um, it's more difficult. There will be plenty of other attack surfaces out there that don't have zero trust that they'll go after first. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's the whole idea to make the attacker's job difficult even once they get into the network because the whole paradigm is you're assuming breach from the get-go and, and making that difficult. And I mean, the point about commercial sector, obviously the federal government relies on, on the private sector for so much of its services and products. So it, we'll have to see how those kind of mandates flow down into contracts and things like that at some point in the future. I, I, you know, it, obviously the government is working on a deadline here too under its zero trust strategy. I think both DOD and the civilian side of government both have their deadlines that are coming up somewhat fast um, you know, there's some urgency behind this. Why, why do you think there is so much urgency? Why is this important? So first on those deadlines. So some of those deadlines are coming due in the next couple of weeks, end of FY23, um, with a lot more, lot more robust deadlines coming up in 24 with a whole zero trust architecture being implemented no later than 2027. But I expect that to be accelerated as much as possible. 
And the reason for that acceleration is the, the risk. There is a lot of risk out there um, when it comes to the enemies that are looming um, at large, near peer adversaries such as China and Russia, and, and even solo actors um, out there that would like to do us harm, implement things into our infrastructure so slowly that we may not even notice um, and, or doesn't warrant a military kinetic response. But over time, the cumulative result will be, be a, a wearing away of our, our social and economic fabric. Sure, I mean, I think there's been warnings that there are threats to critical infrastructure, there have been intrusions in critical infrastructure and attempts to try to get on the network and sit there and wait. Um, you know, w when you think about the biggest threats to an organization's just supply chain of the technologies that they're buying, the software or the hardware or what have you, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges in that space specifically? There's a couple uh, that I would like to highlight. And one of, one of those is the vulnerabilities in the supply chain that can, comprom can compromise multiple systems. Uh, until that compromise happens, you may not know what the trickle-down effect is because of the complexity of our network and the complexity of what software touches what. Um, additionally, as with everything, um, you know, insider threat. Uh, and that's something that you have to do with processes, techniques, procedures, um, outdated software, putting, having that on your network, software that can't be patched or software that doesn't get patched is a problem in that supply chain. Um, poor access controls, third-party vulnerabilities that have been inserted into the actual code that you may not have any awareness over. It's been packaged just like it would normally package. You put on your network and there's a vulnerability in it. And then there's the unknown exploits. The things you cannot plan for, mitigate, um, and that, is always gonna, that risk is always gonna be there. So how do, you, how do you address that issue in itself? And that's with speed. And that will, um, I think you're gonna ask me an AI question, and that's one of the things that AI is gonna help us accomplish. You got to ask an AI question these days. We will get to that, but uh, you know, you used to do comms for the Air Force. I'm sure these are some issues that you had to think about in those days. But you talked about the complexity. Just how much more complex have these challenges gotten? Just with the technology stack, with the different suppliers across a global supply chain. I mean, any any thoughts on just how much that that network and security complexity has increased in recent years? So I'm not going to give you a percentage, but I'm going to give you what my experience is. And the complexity ha is insane. Um, the network is so complex that I would challenge anybody to know exactly what's on their network, exactly at what time, and who's accessing it. Um, this is one of the things we're trying to get after. Um, then you've got the complexity of partners and the complexity of technologies. And it all keeps getting added in there. We, you know. The network was not invented with an end state in mind. It has kind of taken on, not kind of, it has taken on a, as a living, breathing thing in itself um, that there are layers of, of activity. Some is to do harm, some is for business, some is for the government, but we're all together in this um, network of, this network of things. Right. Um, but it is, it is a complete, the network is so complex it would be hard to comprehend without some of the tools that are being put together, without businesses and the commercial ent enterprise working together to bring their technologies to layer on top of each other, to do discovery, and to be able to work as a team to secure that network for what we currently use it for. Sure, and that leads really well into my next question. Uh, how can organizations start to really address these supply chain challenges, these supply chain risk challenges. I know that's something that government organizations that are getting after, something that industry is getting after. What do you think is important to know about current efforts to really start to demystify that complexity? Yeah, so it's critical that the government and commercial work together. Um, 
for several reasons. Reporting, so that we know um, when something happens. So those reporting requirements are critical. It's critical that we, they're not kept in the dark and secret, that they do report them, that they work together to figure out how to mitigate any of those breaches that may be happening. Because those can lots of times be leading indicators to a greater problem. Um, common standards and frameworks work to, the government needs to work together with industry to develop those common standards and framework that we can all operate under. Joint initiatives, initiatives that the commercial and enterprise comes up with and the government enterprise comes up with and to marry those up so that they're not in competition with each other. Um, financial incentives, financial incentives for companies that do secure their networks and are responsible, uh, responsible cybersecurity practitioners. Uh, regu legal and regulatory support to businesses that, that experience issues. So providing that upfront, um, especially if they've already secured their network and everything else we, you know, like they would do with, a, with bank, like the banking system that we've had. Um, Long-term commitment uh, to cybersecurity. This is not just a passing fancy, um, that it is not just something they're gonna implement today and never make upgrades or never address it again. This is an ongoing commitment that is, they have to be in it to win it. The landscape changes on a daily basis and they need to have that vigilance and monitoring and the fortitude to do so. And then, you know, the leadership and governance. Uh, the government has leadership and governance entities out there. Uh, commercial enterprises should have the same that we can work with together to solve these problems and these issues so that they doesn't become something that does threaten our financial, our health care, our schools, our fuel supplies, our food supplies um, as, as a society. Got it. Yeah, I mean, you just kind of ran down a, a great list of public-private collaboration examples, initiatives the national cyber strategy that you referenced earlier really puts a premium on advancing public-private collaboration. You know, what do you think is most important to that long-term strategic collaboration between the public and private sectors versus more short-term, you know, less strategic type thinking about the cybersecurity issues? Transparency. Hmm. I 100% I believe that we all need to be very transparent with each other on what we're doing, how we're doing it, if what kind of threats have happened, um, and so that we can address those together. So, you know, one area where I think we're seeing a big push for transparency is in artificial intelligence. Uh, it's really generative AI and large language models over the past year or so have taken the world by storm, and now I think you're seeing the government try to get its arms around this and figure out, okay, how can we make sure that we understand how these technologies are affecting uh, our, our way of life, I guess. Um, from your perspective, how do we approach these technologies? They're cybersecurity issues that we've been talking about. What do you think about when it comes to AI and, and how we should wrap our arms around it? I think AI is, is crucial to zero trust. Um, it, it is absolutely critical in meeting the objectives um, to defeating the adversary. Uh, and what it gives us is speed. Because um, right now, it takes over 200 days for, for, on average for commercial business to respond to a breach. Um, that, that's not good. So what AI will, will uh, allow you to do is it'll alert you to what's going on. Um, it will respond faster than your adversary can attack you. And if you start looking at those statistics, that's one of the critical things um, to do is to be able to respond quickly. So with the machine learning, um, it gives you visi visibility and telemetry. Over time, that AI model will learn, learn the behavior of your network. And then it gives you um, that telemetry to be able to signal when something's not quite right, right? 
So you have to teach your network first to recognize what's right and what is not. So with zero trust and AI, it will learn your network because you're, you're logging everything. You know, who's, who's going on, who's accessing what, what time they go on, what do they do. People are creatures of habit. So it will log that. And when something's not right, that pa- when that pattern of behavior isn't correct, um, that data will be, will be captured, right? So AI helps you do that. It's, that, that is a labor-intensive pro- process for humans. Additionally, we're going to have a workforce shortage. It, we already have a workforce so- shortage right. within the cyber career fields. So this is going to help us get there. Um, that workforce shortage is, is a real problem, um, especially with these more sophisticated, more complex concepts. Um, I know in, with DISA, uh, Thunderdome has come out with the Zero Trust um, offering, and Herb Kelsey with Dell has come out. Um, they're waiting for their Zero Trust offering to get, to get uh, tested. And with that, you're going to see an all-in-one, sim- they're going to take some of that complexity away. Because what they're doing is they're getting vendors together to work together, an ecosystem to put into place to, for, for companies, for the government, to have an easy button of a one-stop shop so that they can implement that. But within those stacks, I am almost certain that AI is part of their solution. Um, and if it's not, it should be. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard that idea you know, about using AI for, for these, these cybersecurity goals before. How well advanced is that generally? And where do we need to go to kind of bring that to fruition in the future? Yeah, it, you know what? It's, it's in there. They use it. Um, but with anything, um, with machine learning and AI, you have to teach it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those advances will become greater as time goes on, of course. Um, as we learn what we can use them for and, and how much it, it impacts your ability to do zero trust. Um, that the, uh, the AI portion of that ZTA architecture, um, it's not front and center yet, mm-hmm. but it will be um, because that's how it's going to continue to advance because it will free up the human capital to be able to learn harder and greater things than just monitoring a network. Um, Using a a human to monitor a network probably isn't the best use of their intelligence. And I think uh, on the flip side, we're also hearing a lot of concerns about cyber attackers, adversaries using AI to attack a network, right? And that will notionally be faster than a a human uh, defender can, can react to. Yeah, it goes back to the OODA loop, right? Mm -hmm. The um, observe, orient, decide, and act. Um, It's the continually shrinking OODA loop. you got to shrink it down. So we need to be better than them. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, our AI algorithms, we have have smart people working on those. Um, I never underestimate an an American to rise to the occasion. Um, But, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. And... We have built something that's very, very complex. We don't know what's in it. Um, We're trying to make sure it's able to be secured. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Again, I'd like to thank today's guest, retired Air Force Colonel Sarah Cleveland, a senior strategic advisor for public sector at ExtraHop. I'm your moderator, Justin Doubleday, and you're watching Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search extra hop.